Hi, Chris. How nice to see you in this rather strange way. Peter, you no longer have your Aladdin's cave as a showroom. Did I believe you use partners such as Atrium to show your products? Yes, uh, but they do, they do have to be here somewhere. Um, and um, Atrium is a, a, a rare example of a very fine showroom uh, carrying some very important brands. Um, but it's particularly difficult, for example, when it's very, um, at the very highest level of uh, feature lighting, of wow factor lighting made by artists, because there will be many installed uh, in the UK, even in London, but they won't be in spaces where the public can go. Um, so that's uh, a big issue because people are going to be spending a lot of money on something that's going to have a huge impact. It's quite reasonable for them to say, well, can I see one? And the answer is, well, no, you can't. <laughs> with, with some notable exceptions, we, we have the Wonder Room in Selfridges, which has superb installations uh, from Windfall, from Quasar and from uh, Vistosi. So you, know, you can go there and see those. But it's very much um, sheer luck whether there's something installed somewhere where people can go. Yes, you're so right. I remember once coming to you for a Panzeri product and found out the only place I could see it was the Harris bed section. I think that actually the general public and even people within our profession don't necessarily understand the difficulties you can have to see the product sometimes because, well, they're not off the shelf items, are they? You've been in the industry for 20 years. Has the market changed for you much in that time? And has the destruction of the high street in, impacted on us seeing these products? It has done. And of course, the closing of our own showrooms have. When you look at the uh, brands that we were selling uh, heavily uh, when we started and what we're selling now, there's a whole swathe that um, uh, people wouldn't consider, whereas they would have done uh, or did do when they saw them in um, the showrooms. Uh, I mean, selling crystal is very difficult. Selling um, Murano glass is extremely difficult. Um, basically, anything that's not well, minimal, um, or the very, very narrow fashions that uh, where uh, a design has kind of crossed over into uh, general awareness. So for example, for the last four or five years now, it's been what we call balls on sticks. Um, Lindsay Adelman brought out her branching chandelier, what about seven years ago now? Um, and over the last probably a year and a half, it's been the only type of design anybody wants. Um, so you look at all, everything else and think, oh my goodness, all these people are working so hard, uh, designers, artists, um, the people doing the manufacturing to create all these fantastic designs and all people want is balls on sticks. And that's basically through just total lack of knowledge. If you don't know what's out there, you don't know what's available, uh, you're only going to be able to think about those things that you have in, a mental image of and they're the ones that keep popping up. When I was working for an Italian company, I discovered in Italy that they had so much more access to these products, something we don't really have here. So I do wonder if it's a cultural thing. If you ask someone about an artist in the UK, people could probably name a few, but for designers, with the exception of Tom Dixon, maybe, they're not so much in the public eye. Well, that's exactly right. Um, it's not something that people read about. It's not something that people know about. Therefore, it's not something that people remember. Um, a lot of the library that I built up, I was buying in Italy. I wasn't buying here. Um, the, the books just weren't available. It's a strange thing. One wonders why decorative lighting is everywhere um, in almost every other European country and many others, but not here at all. Um, it means that... Um, non-UK suppliers, as you say, can't believe that there aren't any shops here. Can't believe that people um, can't go and see a light. And there are so many designs that we put in the uh, retail character, uh, category because you'd have to go and see it, possibly play with it to understand it and decide that you want it. Whereas a picture might uh, tell you nothing at all. So it, it's a very, very strange market to be operating in where People don't know about what you sell. They're not interested in what you sell. They don't remember what they're told about it because there's no hook, as it were, to hang it on. That's a problem. The irony is, architecturally speaking, we're one of the world leaders. We always are pushing the boundaries of what's possible, but 
when it comes to lighting, which is integral to good projects, decorative lighting is not always given the same level of interest. Given that it's so subjective, how easy is it for you to keep the specification? Well, the first issue is price, because if you normally buy your lighting at IKEA and then you see the cost of uh, good lighting, uh, people just don't expect it. So it means that we've got um, items onto specifications and then people turn around and say, what, you mean you've got to spend that much for a line on getting that? So uh, you're then asked either to value engineer or they just go and buy something else. So forgetting every other consideration, uh, an awful lot of good lighting uh, just gets pushed by the wayside because of price and particularly because the lighting is one of the last things you actually pay for. So at the point where the final decisions are being taken, the checks are being written, every project is um, way over time. Every project is way over budget. So it's the easiest thing to cut. Um, so um, this is something we just live with. Uh, you know perfectly well that either things will be cut or quantities will be reduced uh, and things like that. Now, if people knew about the lighting and the lighting brands, they might be more inclined to keep them in. They'll pay for a BMW, even though they could get a car that works perfectly well from Korea, because they've heard of BMW and it has a certain prestige. No lighting brand carries prestige like that um, in the UK. So um, they, they just all they see is that that light costs more than that light. I'll buy the cheap one, please. It's even more difficult on the decorative side. Specifying office lights, you can talk about energy efficiency, light output ratios, but decorative lighting really is a personal choice. Like you say, I, I don't understand why these designers don't have more kudos here. I guess it comes down to education and where that lies is probably university, but really it's about the general public buying into it. There's no one thing, it just isn't something the English are interested in. If you think of the history of lighting in this country, first of all, people would hang um, a pendant uh, in the middle of their ceiling, um, and then they moved on to peppering the ceiling with grids of uh, spotlights. Um, that was so extremely unpleasant with completely undifferentiated, no character, harsh light. Um, they uh, thought, what do we do about this? Uh, and that introduced something also unique to this country, and that is um, uh, lighting designers getting involved in the lighting of domestic interiors. Uh, and the result is that clients want literally every single light to be dimmable. Of course, that also uh, ignores the fact that dimming a lead is not easy. But it, just stepping back one, what? there's so many lights where we're saying to a supplier somewhere else in, in, in Europe, they want to dim it. And they're saying, well, why would anybody want to dim this light? Um, but it's just a fact. You, in this country, you have to have um, grids of spotlights or lots of spotlights and you have to have a demotic system, you have to have Lutron or something like this uh, because it's, it's seen as a thing to do. So there is um, a sort of fashion-led tendency towards using um, lighting design and uh, demotic systems, ignoring the fact that nobody can understand them, they're not often uh, appropriate to the uses that people want to put them to and all the rest of it. They, they do um, uh, want that and they will pay for it but they won't pay for an attractive um, decorative light fitting. That's quite a problem. Um, you're not alone in your thoughts. One of my fellow lighting designers proposes to just use a Philips Hue light type light with, uh, with the money you save uh, on the control system. You can buy some decent decorative products because that's where the value is. And in 20 years time, it will have aesthetic punch and a story behind it. And again, for me, it's about education of what's out there. That's what we bring for them because we do nothing else. We inevitably know more than they do. So we can team up with them just in the same way that we team up with lighting designers because they don't know about decorative lighting, how could they? Um, so that we, we bring that knowledge. A decorative light is as subjective as a picture on the wall. And that's why it makes it very difficult to, as it were, tell somebody what they should have. Uh, but like a picture on the wall, they can bring so much to an interior. It might be a mood, uh, it might be a colour, it might be so many things, that a lot of them are ineffable. Um, but there is a very important practical point, and that is the future of the planet. 
um, light obeys the inverse square law. So the further away from the thing being lit that the light source is, um, the stronger the light has to be. Uh, so by sticking spotlights in the ceiling, it's the most extravagant um, way of lighting. And we've got to stop doing this. We've got to bring the light sources down to the th uh, nearer the thing being lit. As soon as you do that, you can see them. And oh, gosh, I can see this light. It's a decorative light fitting. Of course it is. Um, so there are moral reasons for specifying uh, decorative lighting uh, besides uh, whatever other reason why it might think of, think of. And even when it comes to control, it, an English person says, I want somebody else to design the various moods I will have in my drawing room uh, and I want them to install it, these other people. Um, and then over the next few years, that'll be what I will use. The German says, okay, you're going to want control of your light, but actually you're going to want control of your light at that particular moment. So instead of having somebody else doing it, and a lot of expensive wiring and goodness knows what else, why don't we create a light where you just wave your hand under it and it dims, wave your hand back, it, it, it goes brighter wave your hand in another way, and it goes from 2,700 Kelvin to 4,000 Kelvin. Um, the, a decorative luminaire is physically near enough to somebody for them to be able to directly control the amount of light they have and the color of that light um, uh, to what they want at that moment. So th there are actual practical um, and moral reasons for having decorative light fittings and cutting down on these spots in the ceiling, which the English are obsessed with. This isn't international. Cheryl and I didn't know about spots in the ceiling because we'd been living in America. Then we came here, and I suppose because of the circles we move in, we didn't realize people were putting spotlights in the ceiling. About three days before we opened the showroom, a presenter of um, uh, a TV program about home makeover um, came and looked at what we were doing and interviewed us about lighting and things. And then at one point he said, what about the spotlights? Well, where he was standing, there were Chinny and Nils spotlights uh, running on cable system, uh, the first mains cable uh, spotlights, so that uh, very important designs, very, very good designs. And I said, but they're there. And we had a complete failure of understanding. And it was only uh, it was only a few weeks later, we realized that what people in this country really do is put spotlights in the ceiling. Um, so it's a very much a UK thing, like this, not caring or understanding or being interested in decorative lighting, which people from every other country just don't understand. I know that contractors use recessed down lights because they're quick and easy to install. They don't have to get a lighting designer involved. They do a grid, which they have done a thousand times, and they say they can say they've done their job. It definitely doesn't create interiors that are welcoming. And for me, it's about layers of light, pools of light. Ultimately, your home is your home, and so it should, it should feel homely, a place you want to relax in, not a beauty salon. Uh, I'm really interested in how you've seen the market change. We used to rely on uh, retail shops that no longer exist, so now we're stuck with what we've got, which doesn't seem to be adequate for decorative lighting. Perhaps it would help if interior designers had a greater breadth of knowledge in this subject. Obviously, what's happening generally uh, in terms of interiors um, affects us. And over the last five odd years, uh, there's been a, a basically a, a, a search for gloom um, to make interiors as gloomy as possible. So you drain all the colour out and then what is there is painted as dark as possible. Um, and clearly that's not only the antithesis to lighting, but it's the antithesis to color, to pattern, uh, to decoration, uh, even to artworks, which is all the things that decorative lighting stands for. So um, what sells most are the most minimal designs uh, in gray or, uh, well, basically in gray. Um, and that, again, when you think of the vast range of, uh, that's possible, unfortunately, all the people who make lights around the rest of the world um, are continuing to produce exciting things. Um, but uh, it means from the perspective of what we find we're selling, um, it's, you know, simple grey things. And balls on sticks. 
I like Scandinavian design. That often has a reason driving the aesthetic a purpose and often there is a great story behind them, such as pieces designed by Anna Jefferson or Paul Henningsen. They're more than lights, they're talking points. All the great architects uh, over the last 100, 120 years um, uh, and many uh, sculptors and artists designed a light. So a, a light can, first of all, be designed by one of the greatest 20th century designers, but also whether it's made by um, uh, Murano Glassworks on the one hand or by type prototyping on the other or anything in between, you've got all these amazing forms of craft. So one object can be by Carlo Scarpa. It can have been made by uh, the Amorano with the, the finest tradition of, of uh, craftsmanship anywhere. And you, you can have this in your own home. Who wouldn't want? Uh, obviously, you can go and get anonymous blobs uh, made in China. And that's what most people are clearly is happy with. But why have anonymous blobs? You don't need many things. You make sure those things that you have have a meaning, a richness. Um, it may also be where you happen to buy it. It can be all sorts of things that we bring to a product as well as what the product brings. Um, but um, you, there's this opportunity to have something exciting that, by the way, is also portable. As soon as you start putting spotlights in the ceiling, you're spending a lot of money on labor, not on materials, and you can't move them. But a, 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 just a really nice light you could take with you uh, to another building, to another room, to the other side of the room they're already in so you've got this richness um, and your children will remember them if you grow up with something in your house that's wonderful or fascinating or bizarre or whatever you never forget it and it can change your tastes for uh, the rest of your life uh, your father had an interesting car you you go and become a professional car designer or something so by having boring lighting um British people are depriving their children of one of the most important sources of, of excitement and richness in their later life. It shouldn't be allowed, should it, Chris? I think that's a great way to end this interview because uh, I'm completely on board with you. Thank you very much, Chris. It's been a delight. Bye-bye.